It's great to see so many of you here tonight in such a good mood at that. It must be the cake. So I want to call to order the February 15th, 2017 meeting of the Dr. Cog Board. And we will begin with our Pledge of Allegiance. And we'll ask Connie to call the roll. Eva Henry? Here. Jeff Baker? Here. Elise Jones? Here. David Beacom? Here. Randy Wheelock? Here. Chrissy Fanganello? Here. Robin Kniech? Here. Roger Partridge? Here. Gail Watson? Libby Zabo? Here. Bob Pfeiffer? Here. Bob Roth? Here. Larry Vidham? Here. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Ann Justin, Here. Lynn Baca, Here. George Teal, Jason Bauer, Here. Doris Trular, Here. Laura Christman, Here. Richard Champion, Here. Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Here. Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Here. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore, Sarah Shakaris Graves, Casey Brown, Here. Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stephanie Walton, Hello. Shakti, <laughs> Jerry Bean, Phil Cernanek, Present. Jackie Malay, Here. John Peck, Here. Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Here. Colleen Whitlow, Here. Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Kyle Mullica, Jordan Sowers, John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Here. Rita Dozal, Here. Heidi Williams, Eric Montoya, Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce J, Here. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Present. Bill Van Meter, and we have a quorum. Well, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce the new uh, folks at the table. Uh, tonight we have Jason Bauer, who's the alternate for Castle Rock. Welcome, Jason. I believe this is the first meeting for Stephanie Walton, who's the alternate for Lafayette. Thank you for coming. And is Catherine Whitman here? She's the alternate for Decono. Well, we're, we're glad she's the alternate even if she can't make it tonight. And then another announcement um, worth celebrating is that uh, Daniel Dick won his recall. Yay. We're sorry that you had one, but we're happy you prevailed. <laughs> Never is. All right, with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the agenda. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? The agenda is approved. And so now it turns to me. I'll start with the, uh, the mundane part of my report, which is um, the Regional Transportation Committee meeting la last week? This week, sorry. Um, uh, RTC unanimously approved the amendment to the TIP, which we will be considering tonight. Um, and also received a briefing on the TIP dual model process that we'll be considering tonight, as well as got to hear the survey results from the 2016 Who is TOD survey, which was very, very interesting. And moving on to my report, um, one fun thing that I got to do recently, along with Chrissy Fanganello and some others, uh, was to attend the Moving People Forward conference that was in Denver last week. Um, Oh, yes, and Director Shernanik was there as well. There may have been others from Dr. Cog. Certainly a lot of Dr. Cog staff were there. It was a great conference, and uh, I had the pleasure of moderating a panel on active transportation, which Chrissy made a presentation on Denver's program, and then there was also reports from Austin and Vancouver. And it was, it was great to see the several hundred people in the crowd talking about these really, really important issues. So, and Chrissy, as you might expect, did a great job. 
So um, the only other thing I had to report is this is my last meeting as your Dr. Cog chair. And, uh, and it's been a real honor. I'm not going to say I'm not happy to turn the gavel over. <laughs> it's a lot of work. But um, I, I really, really appreciate it. It truly is an honor. I'm a, a huge believer in regionalism. And sitting with you all at the Dr. Cog table is not something I've taken lightly. And uh, it's really been an opportunity to um, get to know people at a deeper level and understand your jurisdictions and really think regionally. So many of the big challenges that our region faces don't stop at city and county borders, be it air quality or, or mobility challenges, traffic, affordable housing, you name it. And so I think it's really, really important work that we get to do here. And uh, I'm tickled pink that we finally passed Metro Vision and that we did it unanimously. And it was an honor to be a part of, of chairing that. So <laughs> certainly one of my highlights as a county commissioner. So um, when we actually get to voting on the um, election of officers, which will be momentarily, I will uh, turn over the gavel to Mr. Roth. But until then, we, we get to listen to the report of Doug Rex. <laughs> Thank you very much, much Madam Chair, and, uh, and good evening, everybody. I do have a number of items today. First, on a very happy note, um, I was at the city, city of Castle Pines City Council meeting last night, and they unanimously approved uh, joining Dr. Cog. Um, so that and what city do you reside in? It is a personal point of pride that the city of <laughs> Castle Pines is now a member of Dr. Cog. I, I, won't, I won't lie. Um, they did a, they, the council appointed uh, Councilperson Tara Radliff as the member and Councilperson uh, Jeff Blue as the alternate. So I would imagine they'll be at our meeting next month. So please welcome them when you get a chance. Or let me know and I'll just I'll hang out at council and, and welcome them. Um, we... Uh, uh, Late last month or early this month, we, uh, the, the, the Dr. Cog Executive Committee had lunch with the CDOT Transportation Commissioners. All the commissioners within, our, within, our, within the Dr. Cog region were present, Gary Reef, Ed Peterson, and Shannon Gifford. Um, there were also a, a couple other commissioners that joined, three other commissioners that joined us, Kathy Gilliland from uh, Region 4, kind of the North Front area, Kathy Hall from uh, Region 7, Grand Junction area and Rocky Scott uh, down in Colorado Springs, Region 9. So we had a great discussion, talk, talked about issues, uh, transportation issues around the state, the opportunity for better co collaboration and coordination between CDOT and Dr. Cog, and uh, to also talked about, of course, the, the, what we always seem to talk about is the possibility of new transportation funding. So um, it was a good meeting. I think it's one that we're going to continue to have. Um, I don't know if it's going to be quarterly, uh, but we'll, we'll be having them on a regular basis. Also attended a number of other events, um, including the uh, AgCog dinner, which was hosted by uh, the city of Brighton. Uh, that was it was probably it was probably the most beneficial event that I attended this this month. The guest speaker spoke on spoke about the signs of stress and uh, and how to relieve that. We actually did this uh, 20 question stress test, and uh, so if if you answered in the affirmative, meaning that you were the the question. What is it? They, they, you got this store going, don't I know, I know, no. But you were there, Herb. You were there. Herb was there. If you answered, if if you if you answered the question in the affirmative, meaning that it was stressful, then you 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 gave yourself a point, and if not, zero. Well, I, first five questions, I I had, I had points, and I was like, oh my god, this is not good. But you'll be happy to know I did pass the test, um, and um. um it, it was it was curved, yeah. It was pretty it was corrected on the curve. No, it was good. Um, also um, attended the uh, the NATO meeting, the, the North Area Transportation Alliance meeting, where they did uh, discuss the the regional sub regional dual concept for the tip. Um, I think it was correct me if anybody uh, believes otherwise, but I think it was well received by by those in attendance, and um, so that that was good news. Also attended the South Metro Chambers Economic Development Group. Meeting hosted by Englewood and Mayor Mayor Jefferson kicked off, and gave a gave a nice welcome to everybody and introduced the city manager. Spoke through to uh, some of the initiatives going on in Englewood. We also had presentations by um, the uh, Centennial Airport CEO on the state of affairs at, at of course one of the nation's um, busiest general aviation airports. 
um, and also a presentation by RTD Scott Reed on the current state of, um, of uh, RTD function and fast tracks. Uh, also, a couple, a couple uh, studies and groups down in the south involved in transportation. The uh, South I-25 PEL steering committee meeting was last Friday. Attended that. Um, they shared the results of two public meetings that, the, that were held along the corridor. That was very interesting. And uh, the C-470 coalition. Um, I would like to point out that the, those of you who have been around for a little while probably know about this group, the Impact 64 group. Um, Dr. Cog. Is, uh, has co-hosted a couple meetings now with the Metro Mayor's Caucus um, of the coalition. Um, and really the purpose of that group is to try to find a pathway for new transportation funding statewide. Um, you know, questions such as, you know, can we agree on a statewide package? Um, you, know, uh, you know, how might it be funded? There, there's, you know, I think there seems to be leaning towards the possibility of a statewide sales tax for that. And how much, of course, and looking at around $750 million annually. But I think as far as the statewide package, what seems to be the consensus amongst the group um, is that it has to be flexible enough that to meet the different needs uh, throughout the state. You know, us here along the Front Range and specifically within the Denver region, we have uh, different uh, modal concerns and needs that may be in, uh, in places on the Western Slope. So the discussion is going well. The, uh, there is a, um, a meeting scheduled for tomorrow in this room at 1.30. So if you're interested, you might want to drop by and just listen in on that group. Um, the Dr. Cog Open House, uh, I believe, was successful. It was held um, at a, right after our work session last month. Um, we had about 30-ish uh, board directors as well as, um, as local government staff that attended. I think by all accounts it went very well. I know the food was great, so at least we had that going for us. But I would really like to thank Dr. Cog's staff, specifically those that reside in our communications and marketing department. Um, they really pulled this off. and. Uh, I think it um, uh, you know, really went well. There's a lot of work goes into these things, as you all know, and, and sometimes it goes unnoticed, so I would like to recognize them. A few reminders. Uh, board, o board orientation for new members or those that just want a refresher is uh, tomorrow afternoon at 4, 4 o'clock in this room. There's a flyer available at your table, I believe. So if, uh, if you'd like to just listen to me drone on a little more, come tomorrow at 4 o'clock, and we'll tell you everything you need to know about Dr. Cog. Um, the awards celebration is uh, scheduled for April 26th. That's our big event of the year, and uh, we would really love to have as the biggest turnout ever for that because we've, um, you know, typically we get maybe about half the directors that attend that. So this year we'd like to uh, really get that mem to get that attendance up some. So please consider that. Um, Metrovision Idea Exchange. We have one scheduled for March 9th from 10 to noon in this room. And uh, you also have uh, information at your desk on that. It's planning for economic vitality, the power of place ma making. And we will have a panel that includes uh, Adams, and, uh, Adams County, uh, City of Brighton will be represented on that, as well as the City of Blackhawk, and also from the uh, City of Austin, Texas, um, just to give a little bit of flair from the great state of um, with regards to um, some, of the, some of their economic development activities down there. Last but not least, um, as you will recall, we did schedule um, a public hearing at our next, next uh, Dr. Cog board uh, meeting, which is on March 15th for the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, the uh, 2018 through 2021 Transportation Improvement Program, and associated air quality documents. All of the documents are online, and I would invite you and or your staff to please visit those, visit our website, and uh, provide any comment that you deem necessary. And with it, that, Madam Chair, I'm done. All righty. Um, I think I was remiss in not thanking staff for being very sweet and giving us cake tonight. So I hope everybody's enjoying the blue cake. It's quite lovely. Very sweet of you. Um, moving on, uh, it's now time for public comment. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak to us for three minutes on a matter that's um, not come before us in a public hearing, we have any takers? Seeing none, we move on to the consent agenda, which are uh, the minutes from the January 18th meeting, as well as some minor amendments to the executive policies. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The consent agenda is approved. 
And now we come to the election of new officers, and so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Director Rakowski, who I believe helped chair the nominating committee. The Madam Chair, that is correct. As usual, we have a real problem with Dr. Cog. We've got too many qualified people. We've got a great group of people to choose from, so it's always difficult for a nominating committee to come up with uh, a person. But we made a decision, and the decision was, as you know, our bylaws re require the vice uh, to move up, which happened, and everybody else moved up, which made room for one new person for, shall I say, fresh blood or new blood. And, that was, and we came to the decision that John Dyack would best fill the, that spot. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, the slate is proposed to include uh, Mr. Ro uh, Mr. Roth's already there, Mr. Atchison, Mr. Pfeiffer, and Mr. Dyack. All right. Any discussion? Or I should say open the floor for additional nominations other than the nominate nominating committee slate? We have a motion to close nominations and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, then we will vote on the slate of officers as proposed by the nominating committee. We have a motion to that effect? So moved. A motion and a second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Aye. We have some new officers. Ooh. Congratulations, Chair Roth. <laughs> so if I can get Elise to join me for one moment. Okay. Um, yes. So I wanted to thank Elise for her leadership the last year. It is a lot of work, I know, being on the executive officer team and certainly even more work for the chair. Um, physically, I don't necessarily have big <coughs> shoes to fill, but, <laughs> but I know that I have big shoes to fill. So um, I know that Elise is a, she likes craft brews. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <excited>. <laughs> now, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to have something that had, you know, the, the correct number that held in one container, but I couldn't find that. So there's four bags, four, four different craft brews, and they're from around the region, of course, one of them being from Aurora. So I wanted to make sure that Elise had something, uh, a parting gift from, from me and the, and the entire board. Thanks. You know, having shared some of the other committee meetings, it's, I will admit, a little bit different being in front of this group because, first of all, it's about twice as many people as the other groups. Oh, I should have given you the Aurora one to, to show off. Uh, all right, so we're going to move on to agenda item 10, which is uh, attachment D, discussion of rules of conduct, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, let me just get to attachment D. Um, and uh, well, I, well, let me let me just say this. Well, following the October board, we had an in-service in training um, on organizational safety and liability. The performance and engagement committee was tasked with the formation or the uh, creation of rules of conduct for board for board directors. And of course, as as many of you will know, this was the focus of a, of our February first board work session um, in which our uh, our legal counsel, who is the main author of this document, uh, gave a presentation on and we uh, entertained questions and had a discussion about this item. Um, I would just say that, you know, I'd be welcome to answer any questions you might have on this document. Um, Director Atchison, who, who also chairs the Performance and Engagement Committee, who is responsible for this and has recommended your approval this evening, um, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions? Questions? 
I would entertain a motion. So moved. So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? I did notice earlier today that this is a really easy agenda because I'm just turning it over to Doug for almost everything. So, <laughs> so agenda item 11 is attachment E and is the Articles of Association. Mr. Rex. Correct. Thank you, sir, very much. This is, this is a companion um, agenda item to, to the one we just heard. Uh, the first one created and uh, accepted the, the rules of conduct, and now this one just amends the Articles of Association um, with, with the language necessary to uh, incorporate the rules of conduct. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Seeing no discussion, call the question. All, all those in favor, excuse me, say aye. aye. I'm used to. Yeah. Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions. I think that's a super majority. All right, next is agenda item 11, which is, excuse me, 12, which is attachment F, and it is Mr. Rex again. Oh, okay. All right. I was on the wrong one. Um, well, this is uh, the document as we internally call, uh, we call the document formerly known as the prospectus. Uh, for anybody who's been around a long time, they'll, they'll recognize what, the, what that is. This document is it's really about three years in the making. Um, when I first came on, I remember mentioning to Steve Cook on our staff that, oh, we'll be able to do this in no time. And I know he chuckled. Well, he chuckled out loud. He didn't chuckle just to himself. Um, and it was a lot of work. I will say that this document is kind of, um, it's the rules, it, it's, it's the rules of the framework of our transportation planning process here, here at Dr. Cog. Um, it is a very valuable document to staff at, uh, at Dr. Cog as well as our partner agency, CDOT and RTD. Um, and I, I think it will be a, a well-received document for, uh, for you all to give you some idea if you ever have a question about process. Um, here, uh, you know, about what, what's involved in the MPO process that this should be able to help you in answering that question. Um, we use the word in the, in the memo of demystifying the, uh, the transportation planning process, and I think that's true. I think it does a very good job of that. Um, and it really, it, it just highlights the policies and procedures for the process, identifies who the key stakeholders and uh, participants are. Um, so it, it this document has been well, re well reviewed by many, many different uh, groups, including our uh, trans uh, Transportation Advisory Committee, um, as well as uh, ACT, where our, our agency coordination team, which is made of Dr. Cox, CDOT, RTD, RAC, FHWA, and other transportation stakeholders. We're, uh, we're, I've, I think we're very proud of this document. I think it's much improved over what we had previous, um, and we do have the track changes version in there, so you can you can see the uh, degree of changes that were, were in here as well as the clean version. We have copies of the, f of the final draft for you if anybody would like to have that now or later. Connie has them available um, at her place. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have um, about this document this time. Questions or comments? Director Cernanek. Uh, for uh, my partner here to the right, uh, this is the one that outlines all the requirements in the TIP process, uh, that it e exactly follows the language of MetroVision? <laughs> well, uh, it doesn't exactly. <laughs> no, the tip, well, the TIP policy document is a different document in itself, but this does highlight the process for the TIP and who's involved and how we do things. Other questions or comments? I would entertain a motion. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. We next have uh, agenda item 13, which is attachment G. Uh, this is, uh, again, Doug Rex, and it, talking about the, the TIP working group that was put together after the last TIP cycle to kind of uh, put together a white paper of recommendations. There's been a lot of vetting on this, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Rex to talk about this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, and this was the, uh, the other item that was on our, our February 1st um, uh, board work session. 
Um, we had a very good discussion about this item, I believe. Um, and I'll just throw it open to you all on how you want me to proceed with this. I can certainly do the presentation over again if you wish. Um, so I, I just, it's up to you. Uh, we'll, uh, Ashley. Director Stolzman. I just have one request. If you could address the letter that's at our place. Yes, That'd thank you very great. much. I was, I was just about to do that and appreciate it. Yes, we, um, as part of the discussion that we had, um, we had some questions that we wanted to, we want to interface with FHWA and FTA, our federal partners, about just to make sure that we were indeed following federal, federal regulation. Um, they, they, in particular, because this is, you know, although there are places around the country, in particular Seattle, that are doing this type of dual model, um, the, the vast majority do it kind of the way we do it as a centralized process um, and, and the like. So we, we, um, uh, so we set up a meeting with, uh, with our regional FHWA and FTA uh, folks as well as headquarters staff to just discuss the, uh, the, the concept with them and to get their reaction. Um, as, as the, later, the letter states, they, um, they, they feel that we are at least what, what we know as of now that we are in compliance with uh, federal regulation, but they did kind of put some curbs around um, our future discussion about this concept and that's included in the letter and uh, I think it provides us with a with quite a bit of detail for us as we go forward to make sure that we we uh, and we will make sure that any any draft policy that we present to you all is in compliance with what they what they are requesting other questions or comments director Shakti um, the regional funding I think I read somewhere that it would mostly go to other agency projects like and I would just want clarification on if that's true or what it's open would be open to. Right. Well, kind of I guess. Um, you know, the, re the 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 whole concept of course is two pots, right? So there would be I say pots. I'm, su I'm supposed to be saying share, but I I keep forgetting that. So two shares. There's the regional share and the sub-regional share. In the regional share um, prod, prod, there would be a separate call for projects for the regional share and um, the, the, at least in concept the funding would go to projects that are deemed to be transformative in nature right and that's yet to be defined what that means and it's not necessarily just projects it could be programs as well and I'll give you an example of that in a second but the um, um, uh, so the regional th there were kind of two concepts with the regional pot one would be that it would go to um, larger regional projects that are sponsored by our, our uh, regional partners, such as CDOT and RTD, that it would be money that would that would basically just finish a funding package, right? It, our money would kind of be the last money in um, that would kind of fulfill the full project because we recognize, although you know, I mean, 150, 100, however many million dollars that are in the regional pot is relatively still a small portion of the money that's spent regionally for transportation. So if we could spread that around a little bit to some two projects, that would be great. But it doesn't have to be, right? I mean, it could go to um, you know, it could fund you know, 100% or at least 80-20, 80% of a project um, that was submitted by anyone who's eligible to, to submit projects. Um, and, and again, like I mentioned, it could be programs as well. I mean, something that I mentioned at least at RTC yesterday, for example, could be a situation in which and, you know, when you guys are developing your focus areas, um, priority areas for us to develop the criteria to, um, we will provide you with information about where we believe we, we are lacking in, in transportation and mobility. And it's like seniors, for example. We know for a fact senior transportation is a problem, right? Uh, it is, you ask seniors, it is their number one issue. So it could be a situation in which we establish a regional pot, a regional pool. There could be a project submitted that, um, that we establish some pool or something to subsidize or complement the monies that we're receiving for senior transportation, for example. Um, so, but I think the important thing to remember on the regional pot, and quite frankly, for all, all the money that, um, that we'll, we will be allocating uh, to projects here in the next couple years, is that we have that we want to make sure, and this was a recommendation of the TIP Review Work Group, that we're able to quantify the benefits of that project. And we, we the TIP Review Work Group, if, if you allow us to do so, um, we will be working very hard 
then to make sure that we uh, we accomplish that goal to be because I think that's very important where especially it's a um, uh, it's a it's an, uh, a growing interest and certainly a requirement of federal highway that we uh, we have a performance based planning approach right to how we do things so being able to quantify that just will fulfill that regulation something else director Shakti are we making comments too please um, so I um, am supporting moving forward on this. I missed the, the discussion that happened before. Um, I'm. It makes me very nervous. Um, so I've been like talking to my staff all day, and everybody's been like, "Are we okay?" <laughs> um, and what I'm nervous about is, I'm nervous that we're moving to a model of spreading the peanut butter instead of a model of having a regional vision. And I think it all comes out in the details. Um, and so um, in terms of both the regional pot and the county pots, I want the, the, the regional vision to be a priority. And I was more comfortable in keeping a little bit more of the money in the regional pot and having it go to more than just our partners but to regional projects sure. that we have mm -hmm. so no, very well stated and and um, let me just answer your your concern and I know that is a concern of many um, you know and of course the devil's in the details and you're right it's the way that we write this up that will really I mean, will be, be obviously very critical um, I would suggest to you that all regional projects are local in some respect, right? I mean, the last tip call, projects were submitted to us by local entities. But when you knit those projects together, they, they were consistent with our Metro Vision goals. They were cons certainly consistent with our re regional transportation plan because in particular capacity project or regionally significant projects, they can't be funded in the tip unless they're part of our regional transportation plan. So um, I hear you, and I think the whole tip review work group hears you, and I'll promise you that what we bring back to you, well, I hope that what we bring back to you will give you a level of comfort as we go forth with it. So one, one quick comment. Um, I would direct your attention real quick if you didn't notice it before, but <clears throat> on the back side of the cover sheet is the tip review work group. And first of all, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank them for the hard work that they've put into this. <laughs> The other thing is that RTC recommended that this group be the group to continue to vet this and, and go through the process with it. So this group will be the one that is um, bringing recommendations back to the full board and um, I would suggest for specific questions maybe whoever is your representative on this group you could reach out to them as well. So I've got Director Cernanek and then Director Kanich. Yes, thank you uh, for recognition, Chair Roth. <clears throat> um, a couple of things just as, as observations, it, it's all we're being asked to do tonight is accept the report, uh, which moves us on a path that Director Shakti uh, has concerns about that I don't think we can totally alleviate because we don't have a final set of recommendations uh, yet, but it does move towards that. Um, what it doesn't what this doesn't do is it doesn't outline any regional principles that we would have that would deal with the strategy and as the letter to our executive director indicates uh, the board would have to actually set those principles uh, and strategies and we have to be uh, since it is federal dollars all be within the federal constraints around that and so uh, I think the work group uh, understands some of the boundaries uh, that are are there, um, but um, it, this doesn't yet um, address some of the things that at least I would like to see, which is <clears throat> regional principles, uh, so that it makes it easier for any of the subgroups to uh, actually understand what may or may not be done. Because in the end, uh, the sub area shares. Um, get uh, there's a recommendation that comes from any of the sub areas and it eventually gets adopted by the board here uh, so there's several review processes uh, my only concern is um, it takes us a long time to begin with uh, and we need to um, actually look to the work group to say what kind of time frame is a sub area 
going to be put under so that it fits within the, the calendar. And so that's a reservation that I have, an issue to be addressed by the subwork group. Um, and all we're doing tonight is essentially accepting the report. Well, I, 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 might, I, might just, Please. I might just address that real quick. Now, and you are correct. I mean, there are, uh, you know, the work group will only be providing recommendations back to, to the full board for, for, your, for your discussion and consideration. Um, uh, one thing we are committed to doing, and I think Director Molay is the one that, that raised this at the, at, the, at the work session, to provide a schedule of milestones of when we would come back to the board for, to you um, with, with that. We, the, the, the work group hasn't met since the work session. Um, we wanted to get your guidance on, you know, if you wanted us to indeed do that. Be, be, the, be the group responsible for that. So um, we plan a meeting, you know, within the next couple of weeks or so, or certainly an, enough time to provide something back to you at the March meeting. Director Kanich and then Director Brockett and then Director Christman. Thank you much, uh, very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I, uh, Denver, we also had alternates at the last meeting. We did debrief with them, but um, it's obviously a little bit harder for them to weigh in at the same level. Um, I think the, the federal letter, letter that you provided today is actually really helpful, and it, it short changes a number of my questions, which is that this is still about regional priorities. It just, and I think it's very clear that they make a, a point here of saying that the local priorities then are secondary, so that you can add secondary layers to that. And I think that, that I think helps to knit together the idea of regional vision but local flexibility. And um, but I do think that this is still a big step. And and I guess I'm a little nervous about the draft schedule that I saw on page nine um, of the of this section. There's many page nines, I guess, but the one that has the calendar on it. Right. It, it, and and here I, I am a huge fan of having technical people lead technical work. So I am glad that we have this working group and I have no discomfort at all with them doing a lot of lead work. But I'm concerned about you know not hearing back from them until a retreat in August or not you know it's it's kind of a big gap and I guess you know here's an example and I I, I know we don't want to debate all the principles now but I think one principle we may want to consider is that we I think go slow which is we don't put all the money into subregional allocations I mean I, I I was nervous to see something as high as 70 percent that to me seems like way too big of a step for something that's so new and so so I think that. To the extent we can find a way to maybe have some iterative questions that come back to work sessions, for example, to take temperatures and to debate things like that. And I, and I know that it always comes down to the full package and knowing all the details, but I think it's a disservice to let the technical group work for a really long time and do a complete product without having some iterative check back with us just to say right direction, wrong direction, or like here are three things, you know, which do you think, sh you know, what, where's the most energy we should spend um, so that we really get a chance to kind of, because uh, the timeline required is pretty ambitious and we're not great with timelines. We, we struggled. <laughs> um, and so I just, I think thinking about something iterative that totally makes use of those technical folks um, but, but allows us to, to do some of that would be great. So, so, so cautious thumbs up, but, but thinking about that process stuff and how to, how to do it well. Thank that's, you. That's good information. Thank you. Appreciate it. Director Brockett. I just had a question about the makeup of the working group. Uh, I know at the last uh, meeting it was raised that there's only one Boulder County representative and we're going to look in the possibility of adding a second representative from somewhere in Boulder County. Is that still a possibility? Oh, that most definitely, yes. That'd be great. Yeah. So we can um, talk about that offline. Yeah, but. that'd be great. We've had a couple reach out to us. Um, I haven't responded back to either right now, but I, I would suggest the, the way we did it was that the Boulder County reps, that whether that be you know, the alter, alternates or the members get together and make that determination. Uh, 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 the, the, the members and alternates of, the, of TAC, Transportation Advisory Committee, get together and make a determination of who they want represented on, on the work group. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank but, you. But we will reach out to them. Director Christman. Uh, my concern is on page 9, too. It's the schedule as well. Um, this is a huge project for this work group, and you guys have done a great job thus far so I'm not being critical what I am concerned about is um, it's not until fall of 2017 that you currently have calendar and I know this is just a draft mm -hmm. uh, they initiate the process for formation of county sub-regional forums and prepare forum guidelines and then you have some suggestions within that 
And I, I don't want to say that the counties and the local governments don't always get along. And I don't want to say that there aren't people who get very tied up in guidelines. But it could happen. <laughs> and um, this is, within the subregions, one of the most important uh, issues. If you don't start it till fall, you finalize it in January and form it. I'm not sure that gives you enough time, and that's my concern, and that's all. No, thank you very much. No, um, you know, we're anticipating that the call, the calls would begin. The, 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 the regional call would happen first, and that would kind of be like in the first quarter of 2018, and then the, um, the sub-regional calls would then occur once the regional call was done, because there are probably some projects that will um, that will apply for the regional call that they don't get funded that could be funded in, in the subregion. So, and, and that would occur like, you know, the summer of 2018. Um, you know, what we're suggesting, and I, I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, there's, there's no reason, I guess, to wait until the fall of 2017 to begin the formation or discussion of this. Um, but I think this was kind of a drop dead date for those subregional forms that, to begin to, 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 to form. Could I have Director Kanich again? Yes, I apologize, Mr. Chair, for bringing in a second time, but I forgot to ask. Um, Rereading the federal letter again, just really quickly, I, I, I'm not totally clear what their final guidance was on the Denver Broomfield situation. And so, um, is it that we just need to, they will need to review whatever we have and, and see it again before they know, or do we plan to get further guidance from them on? how the standalone city counties will be considered by them in, in terms of this, but it, 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 it doesn't seem very clearly defined in the letter. Yeah, it kind of leaves it a little open-ended, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, that was the, the one point of consternation that I was really having about the sub-regional process was that, you know, it's different than like Seattle's done. I know I mentioned Seattle a lot, but that's kind of the model we based it off of. Within their counties, there, there are counties where the sub-regional forms, um, there was no county that only had one entity. And of course, we have two. And federal regulation states that um, you cannot suballocate money directly to any one entity or any one mode. Um, but that same section goes on to further say that basically, as long as it's part of the transportation planning process that is vetted transparently, I'm paraphrasing, that um, it 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 would be allowed. So as so, like, can I can I clarify, Mr. Yeah. Chair? So like. As long as there are public meetings and it's transparent, it's not right. happening in a boardroom, and there's a exactly. place where other stakeholders are coming in, even if it's one jurisdiction. Right. Okay. Right. And, and that our full board understands what your process is, what your selection criteria will be, like the other sub-regional forums will have to have. Yeah, you know, you'll have to have criteria as well. Thank you so much for that clarification. Yep. Actually, as, as I read the letter, um, not only will Denver and Broomfield have some of that same scrutiny, but all the subregions will. Correct. So there's no. Yes. So I've got Director Dyack, then Jones, then Malay. Director Dyack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to uh, thank uh, thank the uh, task force for all their all their efforts. This is a big uh, uh, a big concept to kind of shift. It's a it's almost a mind shift of of how we do this, and I think the goal is to try and. Uh, try and do away with the uh, long duration of uh, discussions that we had to, to determine criteria. So I'm hoping uh, it can be a, an efficient and effective uh, scenario which, which we can consider. Obviously the devil's in the details, but um, to me I'm, I'm quite optimistic that if, if any, per, any team can do it or any board can do it, we can. Um, I, you know, throughout the years this, this board has shown great collaborative skills and to me um, we all kind of view Metro Vision a little differently with priorities and this kind of empowers the the, the sub-regions to uh, to show or to fill the needs of what they perceive to be Metro Vision's highest priority and uh, without the the definition of uh, regionalism um, we, we talked about at the work group so to, to I guess sort of uh, answer a little bit director Kanich's uh, comment um, there was a slide that was that was identified uh, for la for the last tip cycle and the regional that the, the transformative projects were about 19 percent of the last tip cycle 
and again, we, that's that's something we need to talk about. But uh, to me, it just I'm very optimistic on the future discussions. Director Jones. Um, I thought we had a pretty robust discussion at the work session, so I don't want to repeat any of that. And I'm hoping that somehow all of the important points that were brought up make the, their way back to the uh, work group. Um, but I did want to emphasize one point that I made in sort of being um, cautiously supportive of moving forward with this, because can we say one more time, the devil's in the details? Uh, <laughs> but just really um, the regional benefit piece of this and making sure that even in the sub-regional allocations, again, I, I would prefer that that be smaller as we start out and experiment with this, but that there's incentives and means for um, different sub-regions to work together on corridor projects that, that cross boundaries and that that's clear so that we can, again, even in the sub-regional allocations, get good regional bang for our buck. Director Malay. And I, I guess I want to kind of add to exactly what Elise and John both said. I, I actually see this as a tremendous opportunity, and I'm really excited to see what this next tip looks like. I mean, if, if those of you recall, the, for, the old tip had buckets of, of project type. And to me, that was not, I didn't think that really embraced our metro vision. We, we spent so much on roads, we spent so much on transit, we spent so much on um, bike ped. And when you reach the end of that bucket, even if you had the best road project or the best bike ped project, if there was no more money left in your bucket, you were done. To me, this really gives this body the flexibility to, and empowers you, as John said, to respond to kind of game time, you know, what's happening on the ground right two years from now with transportation and mobility in this region. We're not going to just put money in a bucket and say, we'll spend it till that bucket, till that account is done. So, um, and I look forward to seeing the regional projects. I mean, uh, Mayor Noon and Centennial and I have already talked about potentially things that we can do along these arterial roads that, that cross, all, cross our community. So I feel very, very hopeful. I'm really excited to see what um, this body does with this opportunity that's presented to all of us right now. And I think this TIP has the opportunity to really advance our regional goals far more than any of the other two and a half TIPs I've been involved in. So I, and I, I really do want to commend the um, TAC working group that put this together. So, and, and good luck to the rest of you guys in, in uh, <laughs> as you, no, I'm, not, I'm being very sincere in that. I'm, I'm really excited to see how this plays out. It's a tremendous opportunity. Other questions or comments? Seeing nobody, I'll, I'll point out again that this is just accepting the work group's report, not as a final product or a final report, but accepting the work that they've done so far, understanding that they will bring further reports back to us. Can I have a motion, please? Have a motion and a second further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? abstentions. Thank you very much. So agenda item 14 is attachment H. I'm not sure. It, it is Mr. Cottrell. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So attachment H contains one amendment for you this, uh, this evening to consider. Uh, it's a C-470 managed toll lanes project. Uh, this amendment was tabled last month, if you remember, so that CDOT and the C-470 uh, coalition could meet. Um, and just for your information, they did meet and, uh, and had did uh, some collaboration on how to utilize those, these excess project funds. So this amendment before you allows for the maximum flexibility uh, in the TIFIA loan process uh, by increasing the loans and bonds category, um, that total funding by $52.3 million. Uh, and at the same time, that will separate, separate out the two funding sources. Um, though the project scope or cost has not increased, uh, this excess funding will remain with the project until a future time um, until after the TIFIA loan closes. Um, so at that time, there may be a future amendment that may be necessary to adjust the TIFIA loan amount or any other funding sources um, that may be available. Uh, so with that, I will take any comments or questions that you may have. Comments or questions? You got off easy. Yes. So, oh, <laughs> Director Partridge. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as many in this room have been involved in C4, C470 coalition, which involves three counties and five jurisdictions and uh, city of Greenwood Village as a, a uh, I'm going to say a complimentary member. Thank you, Mayor Rakowski. But w there were some serious issues and concerns with this as it came about because really what it, what it amount, amounted to was the $100 million ramp grant that was awarded to C-470 was uh, being diminished by $52.3 million. So, and, and really I want to give a shout out to Doug Rex because it was a challenge for Doug at first. Doug uh, brought this forward full and transparent no fault on CDOT, it was just a process to go through, but Doug, I want to really call out you. Thank you for doing that. So with that, that 52.3 million was a, a question for the C470. Now this goes through HPT, HPTE, it, it gets fairly complicated, but I'm also actually going to call on uh, Deborah uh, Smith with CDOT to add into this, but I, what I want to tell you is that with many meetings with CDOT, and the HPTE board, we have come to a, a much better conclusion. Just to put it easy in a nutshell, instead of 52.3% out of the 100 million, it really is only 33 and a third percent. Now the reason we looked at that, we really looked at it as a regional approach because what CDOT is trying to do, because of the lack of funding, no doubt, this is what we really perceive, is that they're trying to look at other projects around the state. So they're leveraging these ramp dollars to be able to uh, gather larger loans. And with that, loan rates are very good right now. The TIFI alone will maybe, might be bringing that up a little bit later, a federal loan. They were able to get some very good rates on that. And with that, they're able to use that ramp funding to leverage for C470 and also for other projects around the state. So just in a nutshell, C-470 Coalition voted unanimously to support an, an alternative brought today. We actually testified to the Transportation Commission today to let them know, and I think I believe the Transportation Commission will be taking a vote on this tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion. Motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, the next two agenda items, 15 and 16, which are attachment, attachments I, J, and K, are all under the purview of Mr. Rich Morrow, so I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we'll try to move through these quickly. Um, so the first one, I believe, is the uh, federal policy statement. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you recall, we presented this to the board last month and then gave you a month for yourself and your staff to look through and see if there are any questions or comments or suggestions. And as I mentioned in the memo, we did get a couple. Uh, one that's... Uh, broken up at uh, dealing with housing policy that's broken up between uh, the regional planning section and the aging section and then another uh, comment that was made that we dealt with uh, in the transportation section and so I can go through them or if you've had a chance to look at them and uh, see if there's any comments or questions basically in, on page four in the housing sec or in the uh, regional planning section, we've added uh, some bullets on affordable housing. Uh, prior, prior to this, we really only dealt with affordable housing in this paper in the aging section. And um, I think I was told the language was pretty good, but um, it was suggested uh, actually uh, uh, Director Kanish had suggested that we also should have some housing language uh, elsewhere in the document, not just in, in housing. So we attempted to address that uh, that way on page 4 and uh, on page 12 in the older adult section. And then the, um, the, the transportation 
one on page 16. Uh, I'm sorry, and this is 16 of the document. So um, there's a. And that's the red line version. You can see the, 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 the highlighted area with the comment on transit projects. That language is, was inadvertently crossed out in the previous document, and so we just have have uh, removed that so that it will stay in the in the document as it was last year. So if there's any comments or questions or, or a motion. I'd comments or questions. I, Director Malay. I, I do have a comment on the last bullet in um, on it's on page five in my document and in um, uh, I think it, I'd like to end the sentence sooner than it ends and, um, and remove the, and have choice in the type of housing arrangement and location that best fits their needs. I mean, I think. Uh, can, can you identify what paragraph? Uh, have, it's the last bullet um, on. It would be in, oh, okay, page thank five. you. Yeah. It's on page five. It, it yes. starts with ensuring that policies, yes. programs, and other actions that affect land use and housing support the private and public sectors in providing a variety of housing sizes and types for, for people of, of all ages, incomes, and abilities. My concern is that we cannot in all of our communities or even within this document meet best fits what people determine as their needs. It's so ambiguous in my mind. We can't, you know, I, I just, I am not comfortable with that, going that far. I would prefer to end it with well, ensuring that people, you know, a variety of housing and sizes and type that meets the need or that meet that provides people with choice, but it can't that best fits their needs. I don't. That's too ambiguous to me. I'm not comfortable. Other comments on that particular point? Should we just put a period at the end of uh, lo location? Is that what you're suggesting? I, I guess I'm not. Uh, the is for, support the private and public sectors in providing a variety of housing sizes and types. I mean, I'm comfortable leaving it there. Mm. Other comments? <laughs> Director Kanich. I'm sorry, we miss the wordsmithing so much. We're I'm sorry, I Robin. I just think that <laughs> no. I, here's I'm just. I don't see that as wordsmithing. I actually see no. that as really doing, trying to have us do something that's impossible yeah. for us and to do. It, I was trying to be funny. Okay. Jackie. Okay. No criticism. I'm like, sorry. Oh. I just. It's, I was just. Here's the thing. If that's the only reference to people of all ages and incomes, I think we should try to keep it. I thought at first you made an edit where you said it would a variety of housing sizes and types for people of all ages, incomes, and abilities, period. If that, because I think that may be the only reference. And, and just to be clear, a lot of these, this language was in the senior section. Right. It just, it's just getting moved. Because it just, well, in some ways it talked about all people, but it was embedded under seniors, which I thought was just confusing from a reader's standpoint. But, um, but, but anyway, I, I, I think it's a fine edit. I just think that it's... So in uh, particular, we have a challenge again. for housing for folks based on income right now. Can, can you restate that, Director? Yeah, I was just going back to what Director Malay had said at first, which was sizes and types for people of all ages, incomes, and abilities, period. It was what I thought I could say And then that's the fine. I'm, yeah, that's fine with that. And, okay. And then <laughs> taking out the – so it would be, it'd be editing the third to the last sentence and taking out the last one and a half. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Yeah, I think we got it. Yeah. Okay. Other comments on that particular item? Director Stolzman. I move we approve the policy as amended. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, thank you. So. So let me clarify something real quick. Was that a motion and a second and a vote to just approve that edit or to approve this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Morrow. All right. So the next one takes us to um, the uh, state legislative bills. And uh, the first uh, attachment is really just uh, the bills that uh, you uh, discussed last month, 
I uh, give just a quick update. Um, Senate Bill 11 it has uh, already moved through a uh, couple of committees and is in its next committee uh, on um, March 1st, so that's kind of moving along. Uh, and the transportation bills, the RTA bill uh, is not on the calendar uh, right now. And uh, on the page two, House Bill 1031 has passed out of its first committee, but it has a, a fiscal note, so it's sitting in appropriations. And then on, on the third page, the um, Senate Bill 45, which I'm sure you all know is the, the first construction defect bill um, that is, uh, has passed um, also and is um, uh, awaiting its next hearing in the Senate. And then Senate Bill 57 um, is, uh, has not been calendared at all. It hasn't had a hearing yet. So unless there's any questions or comments on the old bills, we can move to the new bills. Director Cernanek. Well, I was going to uh, say that my understanding uh, is there's some pairing of new bills with the Senate Bill 45. Uh, yeah, but I no, imagine you're going to be talking about that in the new exact, bill section. Exactly. Direct, Thank you. Director Jones. I, I know you're anxious to talk about it. <laughs> I was wondering when it would be appropriate to um, talk about our stances on the old bills. We kind of we, haunted last sure. time because most jurisdictions hadn't had a chance to, to we, review them. We could do that right now. I, th I believe... Um, so what, what I was going to suggest is we have five bills in front of us that we've previously taken a position of monitor on all five of them. So I'll open it for discussion, starting with Director Jones, as to whether or not there are any of those that we want to change our position. Um, well, I would speak to House Bill 1018 on the RTA mm -hmm. uh, mill levy um, authorization extension. This is a bill that Dr. Cog supported last year. Right. Um, it's in keeping with our, our principles, and so I would move that we uh, change our monitor position to support for this year as well. Have a, have a motion and a second. Further discussion on changing monitor to support. <coughs> Director Shakti. Um, we support that. Our city position is neutral because it doesn't affect us that much, but we think it's a good idea for the region. Other comments? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of changing from monitor to support? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Any other suggested changes of position? Seeing none, take a motion on a well, I don't know if we have to have a motion on it. No, you're, we don't have to. Yeah. All right, on to K, which is new bills okay. for consideration. So now we can have some fun. Uh, so I'm, um, I'm going to just start going right down the list. Although I, I know you'll, you're aware that there's a, a handful of transportation funding bills. There's a handful of construction defects bills, and and so if you want to talk about those together that's fine but let me I thought I would go ahead and start through and um, when we get to those bills we, we you could decide how you want to take them up uh, so the first bill that I have on the list is uh, House Bill uh, 1087 which is a pilot program uh, for uh, Office of Public Guardianship and uh, recommending that the board support this uh, this is an issue that our aging staff and our ombudsman staff and others uh, have have seen as a as a, a need in the system uh, for folks who don't have uh, like a family members or a close friend who can make decisions for them. Uh, it, it often creates a very difficult situation for medical personnel and others as to um, how to make those kinds of uh, decisions for the person. Uh, this does not actually set up the full-fledged uh, guardianship program, but it does create a pilot program in three judicial districts to test that out and see how it works. And then in a couple of years, they would come back with a recommendation. So I do want to take each one of these to conclusion before we go all the way through the list. 
So Director Cernanek and then Director Crispin. Yes, this doesn't only address uh, those where a family member is not present. It also addresses those situations where, um, based on circumstances, there's a determination that uh, a family member would not be uh, the appropriate guardian. Uh, and so it deals with that, and that's where some of the staff comes through uh, in saying, uh, in trying to avoid a situation of elder abuse uh, where um, it's kind of your last resort is only a family member. It only sets up a, a, a pilot program. The measures are, are uh, outlined uh, in the bill, and I, I think it's one that I would uh, uh, recommend a position of support, and I'll make that motion. Second. So we have a motion and a second. We had uh, somebody else in the queue. So Director Christman. Uh, is this an unfunded? Can you use the mic, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Is this, how is this being funded? It, it's, it's very It's expensive. the uh, infamous, yeah, it, it actually would have a, a bit of a price tag, but it's the infamous gifts, grants, and donations. Oh. And so the... Um, the proponents, proponents of this, the Guardianship Alliance, the Carl Bar Association, and the others are in the process of seeking those gift grants and donations, identifying uh, foundations and, th and that sort of thing. Okay. So it would be no state money, though. Director Zabel. Thank you. Good luck with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I, my, my question is, looking at all these bills, is it possible that we have a fiscal note Attached or or somehow so we can kind of see that as we're vetting through the bills. I don't notice one, and I think that would really be helpful. Or can you yeah, no, maybe, Mr. Mar, you yeah. could tell us right. when you're describing or some something. Yeah, I can, and I, I'd be happy to to make a habit from now on okay. of at least addressing fiscal note issues yeah. like in the staff comment section. I'd be happy. I think that. that would really be important. Thank okay. you so much. You bet. Other questions or comments? We do have a motion and a second. Excuse me, Director Stolzman. I just have a brief comment um, that because of the first being a Wednesday, we were unable to take a position in Louisville on a number of these things. So if you see abstentions, that's why. I'm sorry, what was the last thing you said? If I'll just be abstaining a number okay. of times during this section of the meeting. So Thank you. I'm just explaining why. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of, of the position of support? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the record will reflect seven abstentions. The next item is Senate Bill 17-153. 17, yes, uh, first of a, of a handful of transportation bills. Um, there are a couple of other folks here who could comment on this as well, but this th listed this because um, this would, I guess, recreate the existing South, tell me if I get this right, Southwest Chief uh, Commission, uh, which was created in 19, or 2014, I think, and it expires later this year. So I'm watching the head shakes. And, um, recreates it as that plus the north or the front range passenger rail commission and adds uh, seats on that commission for MPOs. Uh, I believe it's housed within CDOT or it was, no, okay, see that's why I'm watching. <laughs> um, but uh, and so that's the main reason why it's on here. I've and I and the checking I've done and I think Doug's done some too. I've not found any opposition to the bill. Uh, it was heard in its first committee, I think, a couple of days ago, and there was no opposition expressed at that time. And it's passed on, uh, and it's scheduled for its second hearing in Senate Finance tomorrow. So I'm, well, we could support it, stay neutral. I don't know. I'm just presenting it for for your consideration. Do you, I think Director Pfeiffer. I would make the motion to support it. I know we've had this conversation at Jeff Tag with some of our supporters there that go in there to talk about this for years and I think having the expansion with MPOs having a seat and expanding the scope of that commission is a wise thing for us for all of us and I know those that drive down south it's a it's, it takes forever to get down to either Castle Rock or or Colorado Springs or even Pueblo now so I think it's a good regional effort for the state so I would like to make the motion to support it 
Deborah Perkins Smith. I'll just share information as to where CDOT is on this. Um, we have our legislative meetings on Friday, so this is based on old information before it went through some Senate committee. Um, we are just monitoring. Um, we do have an ex officio position on the board, and it would continue under this new bill. So that's all that we were looking for. Director Rikoski. I believe uh, Director Pfeiffer's motion needs a second, which I'll give. So we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? So the motion and the second are to support Senate Bill 153. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, the next one is House Bill 1153. Okay, and I'm guessing there might be some discussion on this, and <laughs> Ms. Perkins-Smith may have even stronger comments on this one, because um, I've heard that CDOT opposes this bill, um, and, and some of you may have already heard about it in other venues, but it basically uh, changes the uh, HOV 3 plus rule to HOV 2 for all highways and uh, dedicates future federal funding solely to I-25 and um, out, yeah I-25 South and um, so it's on your list to discuss. <laughs> Director Atchison. Deborah, how far are you going to jump out of your seat? <laughs> First of all, we have a legal requirement under state law that requires HOV3. It's also in contracts with the operators of the toll lanes on I-25 and US-36, which I do not believe can be undone by legislation. It would take a court action and a suit against others to bring that about. So this proposal can't even comply with the law. So I don't know how they're going to try to undo that since we've mandated and those fees are statewide on any new capacity would require the use of managed lanes. And this is trying to circumvent that as well. As much as everybody understands, we have a lot of needs for highways, but I don't know that we necessarily need to be legislating which highway project gets done. I think that's why we have CDOT in place. If we do that, then let's get rid of CDOT. Deborah, no, no. our men. <laughs> Ms. Perkins-Smith. Um, so there are three areas that we have concern with this bill. Um, it, it actually identifies support for up in the north, I-25, and then also in the south. And we think those are good projects. So this is not about the projects. It's actually about, um, yes, going from HOV 3 back to 2. You're asking about fiscal notes. If, if it ever occurred, um, even though we have contractual reasons that it, it wouldn't be legal, that's about 4.3 million a year to CDOT. And so that's one fiscal note on the HOV. Uh, there is a second thing that um, projects that aren't already slated, I say in the tip or the stip, the federal funding is required to go to those two projects. What that means for us, first of all, is that asset management, no maintenance, no nothing. It's got to go to those two projects. It means other projects that um, may be competing or we want to go for discretionary funding on something, we would not have the match. So it actually um, makes it very, very difficult in terms of funding other projects, um, and including maintenance. And then the third item is it requires that the, the work on those, the environmental process for those two projects occur within six months and that there can not be a decision not to build. So our AG's office already weighed in with us and said that's not legal, it's preemptive of federal law. So there are a lot of issues with the bill, so um, I've never asked in the years I've been here for you to support a CDOT position. We've always felt that we need to stay neutral, but um, in this case I would like to ask Dr. Cog to oppose this bill. Director Partridge. Now, you would think, why wouldn't I like a bill that directs funds at I-25 South? It's like, come on. No, in all respects, I, I think, I really commend the legislature for trying to look at some things, but I think it may be tunnel visual from the respect of not understanding a lot that goes on. 
but at least the efforts being made there to say we're going to throw some things out there. Something may bite eventually. But I think another concern is if there's a federal road, look at a road that might receive federal funds, does not have HOV aligned to it, would not fall under the ability to receive those federal funds. We have some of those projects in the works right now, so I, I even though I have to abstain from voting on this, I feel very strongly it's probably going the wrong direction. Director Millay. I'm going to make a move to oppose. Second. second. Have a motion and a second to oppose House Bill 1153. Other further discussion? All those in favor of opposition. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. So the motion to oppose is approved. No. House Bill 1171. President. All right, so third, pa third page, this is another uh, trans bill, trans 2.5 or to trans 3 or something. But um, And and again, uh, you, you may have heard about this bill uh, before here, but uh, basically it uh, would authorize another round of trans bonds, I think, on the order of three and a half billion dollars, and um, it it includes a long list of projects that would be funded with the with the uh, bonds, and um, dedicates the funding source for those by, as I put in my comments, I, I, I'd say essentially reinstating the old Senate Bill One, dedicating uh, or directing. 10% of state sales and use taxes um, to pay for the bonds. Uh, I think that's a, kind of the, the short version of what it does. Um, and uh, I'll see if there's any comments or questions, if our the friends question. from CDOT has any comments. Questions or comments. <laughs> or clarifications. Ms. Perkins-Smith. Oh, you can see I'm going right already. <laughs> so CDOT is I saw the mic getting closer to you. <laughs> and closer. So uh, CDOT is opposing this bill, and the reason is uh, we've been there before. Under Senate Bill 1, the funds were then taken away, and CDOT had to um, do the debt service based on taking our other funds, which is why we couldn't do a lot of maintenance on our roadways and could do very few projects. So our concern is that the same thing would happen and that there's not a dedicated funding source to actually pay off the bonds. And uh, you would all be hurt by that if we had to um, use other funds to then do that. So um, the list, I do want to say the list came from our 10-year development program. So it is a list that um, other, everyone's been working on at the TPR level. So it's not the list necessarily we oppose, but it's the mechanism. Director Atchison. Move to oppose. Second. We have a motion and a second to oppose House Bill 1171. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor of opposition? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? It's a motley crew of abstentions. <laughs> <laughs> and the opposition of House Bill 1171 is approved. Um, Senate Bill 085. So the next bill uh, was uh, postponed indefinitely in its committee hearing on Monday. So we can uh, pass right over it. Senate Bill 98. And that one was PI'd in the same hearing. So we, we don't have to. Um, I will note, though, that uh, just as a point of information, uh, Adams County commissioners were at that hearing to testify in support of that, that bill. Uh, but and it's been like the I think the fourth year in a row that the sponsor has tried that bill and he and he has to, has told people that he plans on keep coming back <laughs> every year until he's term limited. So we will probably see that again next year. Senate Bill 155. Uh, first of two of the other two, three. First of the of the three other newer construction defects bills. Um, I'm not sure I need to say a whole lot on these. I think that the first bill uh, narrows the definition of construction defect. Uh, it's been described as making it more difficult to file a claim. 
the uh, second bill 156 I believe is the coalition bill mm -hmm. and then the third bill on uh, House Bill 1169 uh, deals with the uh, uh, opportunity to have a right to repair before a, a claim goes forward director Atchison yeah thank you mr. chairman uh, I happen to be one of the two mayor Adam Paul and myself uh, from Lakewood pretty well live through this construction litigation thing almost on a weekly basis but uh, the Metro mayors has been looking at, at this and this is a portion <clears throat> of the bills that we are hearing will be introduced in this legislation on construction litigation. Um, so we have more to look forward to? Oh, yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. The problem is there is not a, a consensus bill that's being proposed that deals with the entire problem. They're taking out little pieces here and there, and our concern is if anything gets passed and they don't all work together, nothing is going to happen. Currently in the metro area today, 19 communities, myself included, Littleton and others, have passed construction ordinances or plat note requirements to deal with construction litigation. I ask you please stop using the word construction defect. It's construction litigation. We are not litigating anything other than the potential of a finding of a defect. But because of the way these bills are all coming in, and they're picking out little bits and pieces, and we can't get a consolidated thing that really addresses the overall problem. It started with SB 45 that was introduced three days before the Metro Mayor's retreat, at which time we got to the uh, opportunity to talk to the speaker. And let's say it didn't go real well. The con comments uh, kind of summarizing and there's a number of mayors here in the room that were at the meeting is that was very little communication to the groups that had been working on construction litigation for three years but there was certainly some conversation with the trial lawyers group and that didn't go real well and we have still been working to try to get this entire package of all the bills to get on the table so that we understand what it is we're really trying to deal with. My community is, is trying to stay as, say, give me the whole package of bills so we can see what's going on. Now, we understand some of these are not from a coalition. They're individuals that are putting them together. And we really can't find out who are these people talking to to get any feedback on the efforts been made by every community in the metro area for the last three years. How can we get you to sit down and talk to the groups from housing, from uh, everybody that's involved, including the construction industry? So this is continuing to be a problem. I would ask you at the most, please consider a monitor position on these until we get all the bills known and we actually understand what's the impact all these bills are going to have and the cross connection between them. Because right now, today, we don't. Director Shakti. I'm sorry? Other comments or questions? Director Shakti. <laughs> <laughs> so I will, uh, I, I will jump in uh, and give Director Shakti a moment. Um, so as somebody who is not only uh, a local representative for my community, but also has been in the construction and development industry for 30 plus years, um, I can tell you that I would echo what Director Atchison just said. If this is not taken as a holistic approach and it's piecemealed together, it's not going to affect the current situation. And the current situation is that in the rest of the United States, attached for sale properties is about 20 to 22 percent of the residential market. In Denver, Colorado, it's about two and a half percent. Now, people will tell you that that's market-driven, and I will tell you that's BS. Um, I'm in the industry. I hear developers, bankers, insurance brokers, uh, construction professionals every day say that they would love to be able to build attached for sale properties, but they can't take the risk. So the only ones that are being built are being built in downtown Denver and Cherry Creek, for the most part, where the price point is in the 600-plus range, and they can absorb the eight to $10,000 insurance premium that's required 
to satisfy people's uh, concerns about the construction litigation. So um, I would encourage, I would wholeheartedly agree with what Director Atchison said. There's um, there's a lot of ugly things with it, and I think a piecemeal approach is not the right approach. Director Atchison, I mean uh, Shakti, excuse me. Um, so on this particular issue, I am channeling Adam Paul, <laughs> <laughs> and um, he asked me to support Senate Bill 156. Um, and I know you all have worked closely together, so. Um, let me let me clarify. Let me clarify. We're on 155, and you said 156. So are you? I said 156 because we're sort of. Okay. I thought we were sort of talking about All the right. three of them. Think, that's fine. And Thank you, Director Brockett. Well, I, my jurisdiction has a fair amount of interest in this question, but uh, we're also waiting until all of these come together. Um, so I'd just like to make a, a, a motion that we uh, monitor these three bills until um, we know more. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Director Cernanek. Yes, uh, I was at a uh, presentation by uh, two members of the bipartisan group of five or six, depending on the day, uh, that's continuing to uh, work on this. And they're spending some significant time on this. And it is a bipartisan group. Uh, 155 is actually a piece of one of the others. Uh, but they took it out there and saying if they made some progress, they would take what they could uh, on some of this. I. Uh, will echo what Director Atchison said uh, in that uh, what I'd like to see is is all of them on the table um, to s be in a position of supporting um, getting to a uh, collection that will actually bring the large insurers back to the market here in Colorado because that's the only way that we get down to you know closer to that three or four thousand dollar uh, premium that it used to be at uh, and it brings the the large carriers back and that's the the part that they're trying to get to uh, I think that makes a lot of sense uh, I would echo and uh, support the uh, uh, at this time a monitoring of, of all of the associated bills which includes the house bill that's on the next page as well as 155 and 156 directors able Thank you. And I think what we're seeing is just um, a frustration of the stakeholders and the legislators who for years have tried to do a statewide fix on this. And the frustration in that jurisdictions are doing their own fix. And so they're taking bits and pieces and moving them around because a statewide fix has just been out of the cards. And um, I think everybody's hopeful that this year that it's going to happen and I don't see it happening I see what what's happening here in the legislature with all these bills is what's happening in the local jurisdictions they're just splitting it and making it fit into a place and you know frankly we need this to be a statewide approach that all um, and Mr. Roth will will um, I think agree with this that all developers and builders can um, can know the rules that they're known and fair to everybody mm -hmm. and um, so I think this is just bills out of frustration and I, I don't even know how to handle this um. <laughs> so I'm gonna abstain <laughs> director <Atchison. laughs> yeah just let me clarify one piece on it Senate bill 17156 the language in that is the closest to what we have been trying to get to on that one element but it's one element. It's not the, the whole picture. So that's why I'm asking to monitor it. I, and I don't disagree with the, the mayor of Lakewood that that one is actually one that is really getting in the language that we've been pushing through Metro mayors, but it's a piece of it. The other thing I wanted to follow up with uh, Mr. Roth is that we just sat through, uh, many of you attend these in different parts of the city, the Vecra Bank economic forecast. As of last Friday, through the state demographer and the state forecast, for the people who are coming to Colorado, those already here looking for housing, we need to be building 59 residential units a day. 
for the next three years to get even, not to keep up, to get even. And every day that number is getting bigger. And as long as we have this kind of a problem that we can't fix on a statewide basis, we're going to continue to be facing that. To Bob's point, 2.5% of a product that people are screaming for, and we can't get it built because of the state's failure. And I think we made this very clear when we met with the House Speaker. And uh, Robin's mayor, myself, and three others to the Denver Business Journal made it very clear. This is a state legislative failure to act and to move forward for something that every community that has got this problem is telling them to fix so that we don't have to fix it on an individual basis. But that is the only way we're getting an opportunity to move forward, is to have to have 60 or 70 different communities fix it individually and no two are alike. That's not what we need here on a statewide basis. Director Peck. Um, thank you. Just for a point of my own education, I've read all these bills and they seem to not apply to single family housing at all. Mm -hmm. They're all about condos and um, HOAs and so having read these in the HOA statutes, this is, I'm just throwing this out there, I think that if the state looked at the HOA statutes and closed the loopholes in them, it would close loopholes in these construction defects. I just, just saying. I think that that's where a lot of the loopholes are, and I would like to see a bill or at least some legislators look really closely at those statutes. So not to jump back on my bandwagon, but I'm going to real quick. So uh, I am fine personally with monitoring all three of these. I will say that House Bill 1169 is probably the one that I would most like to see us uh, be in support of if we were going to do anything different. This is probably, no, it's not probably, this is the most onerous for <coughs> developers and construction professionals because this, the way the, the way the legislation is today, the builder has no opportunity for a right to remedy. <coughs> so if there is truly a construction defect that needs to be taken care of, the, the construction professional doesn't have an opportunity to do that. It just goes directly to litigation. And that's just patently unfair. If, if any business that you have, if, if you uh, are in a position where a customer has, feels like you haven't treated them fairly, you should have the opportunity to correct that. So that's, personally, that's one of the ones that, or one of the areas of this overall conversation that bothers me the most. The other thing I wanted to mention is, um, so, Associated General Contractors, Associated Builders and Contractors, Aurora Economic Development Council, Adams County Economic Development Council, the list goes on and on for all the organizations that understand what the issue is, Metro Mayor's Caucus, understand what the issues are, are in support of a statewide solution to address the issues, and it is solely the people who work every day at Colfax and Broadway that don't understand the issue, in my opinion. So. We have a, I believe we have a motion and a second to monitor these. Further conversation? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? And finally, we have Senate Bill 40. Okay, so Senate Bill 40 is a CORA bill, the Colorado Open Records Act. Um, there was another one that we were looking at, but it got PI'd, so th we have this one. Um, and uh, had asked our attorney to take a look at it and give us uh, his comments, he and which are reflected in the staff comments. He did not make a recommendation whether to uh, oppose it or monitor it, um, but based on his comments, I don't think his recommendation would be to support it. Um, he talks about uh, main concern being the additional administrative burden that's placed on public entities in uh, responding to these um, these requests for information, particularly converting uh, to different electronic formats and so forth. 
Um, I think that's, that's the main concern that he expressed. Uh, unless there's different sentiment on the board, I think um, after thinking about it, I'd recommend at this time that we monitor it. I know the bill um, uh, is being debated and negotiated uh, at the legislature, and it, it might be worthwhile for us to give it a little more time and see what, what comes out of those discussions. Questions or comments? Director Pfeiffer. So is this bill more, uh, we'd have to standardize the templates and so forth so they're searchable? Is that the way I'm gathering this? I don't uh, feel qualified to answer that. <laughs> Does anyone? Well, you, you're the IP pro. <laughs> Director Millay. Uh, no, it, it sounded like you, we had to evaluate whether or not the data existed and, we, and then, it, and if we and were then able come to up with an estimate of what it would cost to convert it to, to convert it, 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 yeah, in a format that they would we, want. We so I, mean, have, I think it makes sense to, to monitor. We, have a, we may have an expert witness. <laughs> Ed Bowditch. Music? Does he have walk-on music? <laughs> yeah. Ed Bowditch, uh, one of the lobby, lobby team. Yes, uh, Director Malay is exactly right. You would evaluate whether the data already exists. So, for example, if you have an, a data file in an Excel spreadsheet, under the current law, if somebody makes a request, you can send it out to them in a PDF format, and that's usually what happens. But if the data already exists in an, in an Excel spreadsheet, you would have to uh, respond to it in that format if that's what was requested. But the bill is is uh, still in process. It hasn't even had its first hearing, and there are a lot of negotiations. So certainly the monitor is, it, frankly, makes sense at this point. It may change even before its first hearing. Director Shakti. Um, is there, um, can you be paid for looking for the format if it is, takes a long time? Should be able to. Now I'm going to look for a lifeline, but uh, um, you're, you're getting into the details that I'm not familiar with. I know right now under the current fora, and I believe this hasn't changed, the first hour you spend searching and working on it, there is no compensation for it. So you have to ask yourself as an entity, how many CORA requests do we get a year or would we likely get per year? That's where some of the cost comes in for some of the agencies. But I know that has been an issue, um, the compensation for the public entity. Um, with these new rules. Um, I'm not aware that a lot of entities are coming out in opposition at this point. A lot of people are watching. So we have a second person that came to the podium and then I've got Director Trular and Director Rakowski. Yeah. Did you have a comment? Director Trular. <clears throat> My husband and I own a small law firm in Centennial and we frequently have occasion because of the kind of law we practice, to request records from cities and counties. And we have had a number of occasions where the entity from whom we are requesting the records had it in a structured data format, but refused to give it to us in that because they knew if they wouldn't give it to us in that, that it would cost us a lot of money to convert it into a format that our experts could use. I think, I'm not suggesting we do something right now other than monitor it, but I think if the data that someone is requesting from a local government does exist in a computer format that allows somebody to give it to their expert and their expert to utilize the data. I think if they have it in that format already, they should have to give it to us when we request it, rather than deliberately converting it to a PDF and refusing to give it to us. The client that we request this data on behalf of is not a client that has a lot of money. It's a client that doesn't have a lot of money, and it's somebody that we've represented for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I think there ought to be a law that if they have it in, I'm sorry, I'm not IT savvy enough, but if they have it in what is being called here a structured data format, they shouldn't convert it to some format that makes it impossible for us to utilize it. That's, that's what I think. So I think monitoring it is fine for now. But I think local governments, if they have this data in a format 
that it's been requested in, they should have to give it to us. Director Rakowski. Move to monitor. Second. We have a motion and a second. I did have Director Zabo with the question or comment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we discussed in our meeting about this bill is um, we already have that ability to take the data out and make it into a PDF, which you can read and everybody can read. But what we saw as issues were, if we have a working Excel spreadsheet and we give that spreadsheet to you, you can manipulate that data because it's in those fields. You can change it, you can delete it, you can do whatever you want. And some of it might be like, if I'm like, you know, if you're like me, I'd probably end up deleting it and not knowing what I did by pressing, you know, F4 or whatever. And also, sometimes in some of those spreadsheets, you could have HIPAA data that would be against the law to give. And if we have to give those spreadsheets, that could be a huge issue of liability and different things like that, depending upon what you're requesting. Director well, Trular. <clears throat> there's no data that we request that's protected by HIPAA. But this bill is not just directed at your company. No, I This is for everybody, the whole I state, am, too. So I, I get that. But if it exists in a format that the requester requests it in and the city or county deliberately changes it to a PDF so that we can't utilize it, that's not right. I mean, it, they ought to have to give it to us in the format where it can be utilized and not utilized like you're saying. I mean, we've never requested HIPAA um, doc, something let's, that's protected by yeah. HIPAA. No, no, no. I, I agree let's, with you, but I'm just let's, saying let's, it could be. Let's, let's try to avoid crosstalk, please. Um, <laughs> did you have something else, Director Zabo? I was just saying, no, you might not request HIPAA data, but you request something else, and their HIPAA data is in that spreadsheet, and I have to turn the, my Excel spreadsheet over to you. That also could be proprietary. Someone invented that, and it's not for me to give to someone else. And so I give you the information that you ask for, and that's by law, not extra information or manipulation information you could possibly manipulate. We voted at Jeffco to monitor, Direct but that's some of the things that were brought up. Director Pfeiffer. So being the IT guy here, uh, <laughs> let, me, let, me just, let me just real quickly just weigh in. One, you can take any PDF and put it into any form. Anyone can do it. So the reason why I would only do it in PDF, well, this is my fear. How much time does it take my clerks to make sure, oh, wait, do you have Windows 10, Vista, Windows 8, Windows 97? And all of a sudden, everyone comes back and says, well, I don't have the right version. You have Excel, but there's 45 versions of Excel. That's my fear in this. Not the data, because it's transparent. It's the fact that my clerks are going to be in, tied up for hours on end because somebody doesn't know how to work Excel. And so it would be best to just give it PDF like I do, I can cut and paste all this out and put it in Word and manipulate it all day long. Show off. You know, but any of us can do this, yeah. and it's all freeware. So, you know, I just think that we, <laughs> monitor's fine. I just want to put the facts out there that this is not a big issue, but honestly, I don't think we should support, my personal opinion is this is not something we should be supporting because right. I think the tools are there and so forth. It is very dangerous, and it's going to cost our city a lot of money to do all the back and forth on the version issues data aside. Director Sullivan. Thank you. Um, I just want to say coming from a small community that has been through a few very broad core requests lately, um, that this would be enormously onerous for our small community. We have one person who can respond to core requests. Um, I would actually be in favor of saying all core re requests should be submitted in PDF, period. And um, I, I agree there's, this creates just a lot of logistical complications to just what's already a very difficult process. So I would be in favor of an opposed position on this. So we have a motion and a second to monitor further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Right here. Abstentions. Yep. Abstentions. He's just not. Well, 
and the motion to monitor passes. All right, we'll be back. Oh, I'm sorry, Director Shakti. We have two bills in Lakewood that we are interested in having the board take a position on. I don't know if that can be done tonight, but I could at least bring them up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 1151, electrically assisted bikes, um, and it, it basically defines the different types of bikes and says that um, you can say which kind of bike can go on which kind of path, basically. Um, and then 1166, which is access between highways and adjoining businesses. Um, I think for us the issue is really like on, Wadsworth is a state highway and um, there are lots of issues about where we need to put in additional lights and where we need to, and in order to make it so that the cars can keep going, we don't want to have roads that go to every business. Um, so um, we feel like it's pretty balanced the way it is. So if somebody from staff would correct me, I believe that any director can ask for Dr. Cog to take a position on a bill that we haven't already. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you. You can always okay. bring up the different. So do I make a motion? You don't need to. Okay. Director Beacom. Can you, can you talk into the mic, please? Uh, I just didn't catch the second bill number. 1166. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Director Trular. I, I didn't catch the number of the first bill that you mentioned. The first bill is 1151, and the second bill is 1166. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other bills that a municipality or county would like for us to take a position on? Very good. We will move on then to agenda item 17, which is attachment L. Daniel Jarrett. Well, thank you, everyone, for letting me come and talk tonight. I will try to keep it brief. I think I'm one of the few uh, roadblocks keeping you from uh, leaving and enjoying the rest of your night. And I'm an economist, and I talk at a lot of conferences, and I know usually, usually they put me at the end. So, so well, I'll try to, I'll try to keep it light. Um, I'm here to basically just give an update on a process that is actually really important to a, a lot of the work that we do at Dr. Cog, um, and that is an update to what we call our regional economic control forecast or our macroeconomic control forecast. Um, we, all of our modeling work, and I'll get into this in a second, all of our modeling work starts from a macroeconomic forecast for the Dr. Cog region where we consider what the future looks like for population and households and employment um, at the regional level. And currently, our forecast is going, f starts in 2010 and goes through 2040, which is our forecasting horizon, the Metrovision horizon. So it's the horizon for all of our modeling work. Uh, it's been a few years since since we updated uh, the, the forecast. In fact, I, it, I'm about five years in here at Dr. Cog, and the last forecast was completed right as I stepped into the position here as chief economist. And, and obviously, we know now that we need to update, um, most importantly, because of the growth that we've seen in the Denver region. Um, you know, we, what's happened between 2010 and 2015 has been, you know, enormous. Um, you know, we've been one of the fastest growing um, metro areas in, in, in the country. So what we're proposing is to move our forecast horizon, start in 2015, keep the same end horizon, which is 2040. Um, and the work, we, my team's already started the work, and we're going to try to finish it this spring. Um, why it's important is that this drives all of our other modeling work. And I've, I've listed, you know, basically the kind of the four big pieces that we, that this forecast drives. One, this is what feeds our land use forecast process. So we take these regional forecasts for population and employment out to 2040, and then we use our urban sim land use model that I know I've talked to, um, to some of you about um, in the past to basically allocate those down to the jurisdictions to a smaller geography so we get a feel for what households and population and different growth patterns would look like uh, with different assumptions. Um, that then subsequently is the major input into our focused travel model 
which you know, it produces things like VMT and greenhouse gas, and it supports, you know, our air quality modeling. So you can see this is kind of the top, the top line of modeling that has, that has to take place before we can run our land use model, before we can run our, our travel model. Um, the, the, this, this data also just supports a, a lot of our MetroVision um, analysis, a lot of the metrics I, that you have talked about um, for, for you know over the past year with Brad Calvert, um, you know this this data goes into helping support a lot of that work. And then finally, too, just like to mention that you know this is also it allows us to kind of have a sandbox to play in. So what I call scenario planning, but we like to test a lot of things out here and see you know what does a different growth pattern look like. Um, some, something that we've done over the last year, um, and, and we're looking forward to continue is is to use this to use this data also to support all of our aging efforts. So so it's a really critical piece, um, and it's something that we just wanted to be very transparent about that we're going through this process. Um, exactly how we go through this process, uh, I've been having and my team has been having um, quite a few conversations with, with the state demographer in Elizabeth Garner's office and um, we're trying to start a little bit more of a feedback um, loop where you know we have a lot of valuable information on kind of the spatial allocation and different development patterns and what we see is actual kind of capacity um, constraints here in the Denver region for growth and, and we, we, we are constantly updating her on, on how our models look and then she takes that into account when she's developing her new demographic forecasts um, at the state level and then down to the county level. So that, that's kind of our first, that's our first step and that's what we're doing right now is just kind of both getting on the same page um, so we know that, that the, how we look at the Dr. Cog region is very consistent with how she's looking at, 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 the, at the counties that make up the Dr. Cog region and then also how we fit into the state. Um, what we're about to do and what we, what we have been doing actually for the last few weeks is starting to actually do some internal modeling. So, uh, you know, we, we have capa uh, capacity and skill set here to, to do a lot of the econometric forecasting model, the more statistical work, um, basically stress test, try different scenarios. Um, and then once we come up with a once we come up with a forecast that you know we think looks good and that Elizabeth thinks you know looks good, what we're going to do then is assemble. I've been working, um, talking with a, a, gr a group of a small group of economists around the region, um, some from the private sector, fr some from the public sector, academics, trying to get a very broad perspective. So uh, you know everybody has a chance to chime in, and we'll get together and have a discussion and basically you know kind of get a thumbs up from them that, that that they think yep this is consistent with what we see regionally at the state level. It, it, it fits in with, with what we see with current trends. Um, and then we'll come back to you and we'll, we'll um, basically you know, present to you uh, what, what we have um, and basically just kind of ask you guys to, to accept um, that forecast and let us work with that um, for our modeling process. Um, as far as the approach goes, and I, I there, there's n uh, nothing technical I'm going to talk about, but but what we want to do is we want to ensure that when we come to a conclusion and we come to a forecast that everyone agrees on, that it, it tell it, that we can tell a consistent story where we've taken into account obviously what's happening with the global economy, what's happening with the U.S. economy, how the state of Colorado fits into the national picture, and then also how the Dr. Cog region fits into both the state picture and the national picture. The, the analogy that I use quite a bit, and this is um, both from a, from a theoretical st um, standpoint in, in forecasting work and then also just kind of a, a good way to think about it is if, if, if Doug and I had a rubber band tied around our waist and we were walking and we started walking away from each other, you could imagine what would happen if we walked too far away. There'd be a lot of tension, right? And we'd kind of pull back together. That, that's the way we think about modeling here is we want to make sure that at, when we think about the Dr. Cog region and how it fits into the state and, and the U.S. economy and the global economy, that it's consistent, right, because these things do have relationships and that's ultimately what we're going to try to settle on is, is a forecast that, that we think is consistent, that tells a very consistent story. Um, you know, when we're looking at population and employment, these are especially big regional totals. These are slower moving factors, so, you know, the forecast that we're working with right now isn't going to look dramatic different than you know what we've been working with um, you know population birth rates death rates those things don't change um, quickly obviously migration has here um, and that's the one thing we want to try to pick up with this new forecast but um, in, in a nutshell that's um, that's the process that we're, we're looking um, to, to to forward this spring um, and you know and I'll be back in a few months um, after we've had you know our, our initial set of meetings to kind of let you know um, where we've landed so so I'm happy to take any questions? Director Cernanek. Yep. Director Cernanek. Yes, uh, thank you, Daniel. 
Um, as you go through, and particularly with your stress tests, uh, at least uh, an area of interest that I think might be uh, good to cover is what are the key assumptions and variables? So as you're going through the st stress test, which, which causes um, greatest variability with regard to those things that matter, whether we're talking about congestion or air quality or in the area of density and land use mm -hmm. uh, and how those may uh, have some corresponding interest to some of the things that we have before us. Uh, so taking a look at those and so as you're going through the stress test, uh, trying to capture some of those. And I understand the elasticity tending back to the mean, uh, but what we're hoping to do, uh, at least uh, from uh, a, a competitive, being a competitive region, is um, uh, to move in a positive direction relative to the mean uh, with those things that uh, matter to us, which is general wealth and development of the community as well as quality of life. And so um, taking a look at, at some of those, recognizing where Metro Vision is trying to take us, uh, what are the th some of the things that we need to uh, both monitor uh, and what are some of the things, together with our partners, we can influence to actually move in the right direction. Right. Um, it, my answer back would be, you know, so we will develop this long-term forecast and then basically kind of overlaid on that long-term forecast, my team, um, I, have a, I have a team of economists um, that w w this, is, this, is, this is our life and this is, you know, we're, what we're in every day is we're monitoring, obviously, you know, shorter-term events because when we're thinking about forecasting out to 2040, we're, we're not necessarily thinking about, obviously, we know economists are no good at forecasting recessions um, or business cycles. So we're thinking that th those things are going to wash out over the long-term over 2040, but then we constantly are looking at the shorter term, um, trying to take into account, you know, the things that we're seeing day to day, and then those will kind of help build back up to the longer term model. And we spend a lot of time with a lot of data, just building econometric models, testing these relationships, seeing how those relationships have changed over time and what, what's causing those changes. Okay. And you've heard us discuss this evening something that significantly is distorting the residential housing market here in across the state of Colorado. Uh, that is acutely being felt in the in the metro region, mm -hmm. uh, and um, in my opinion, it's not positive. So, um, you know, as we look at trying to relieve some of those constraining factors in what we're hoping to see, um, you know, those are some of the things that that also can be helpful to us. All right. Other questions or comments, Mr. Chairman. Director Rikowski. You know, when engineers in transportation talk to engineers, they kind of get their stuff together, but they don't necessarily are able to apply it because the ultimate consumer doesn't accept it. I would suggest that when you finish talking to other economists, you bring in some people that don't know who Samuelson was and have instead give it an acid test with the business community and some other folks to see if you're really in reality before you bring it to the board. Anybody else? This is not an action item. It's for information only. So thank you very much for the presentation. And next we have agenda item 18 committee reports starting with stack director Jones. All right, um, so the January 27th meeting, um, there was a lot covered, so I'll just hit some of the highlights. Um, CDOT's going to be piloting Bustang buses for skiing on I-70 West twice in February. So I'm sure Deborah will let us know how that goes. Um, the record of decision um, was finally completed on I-70 Central after 13 years. Uh, the Transportation Commission will be considering how to spend some of its unused funds in its contingency fund, <laughs> about 10 to 20 million. Um, and there will be sort of geographic equity in the projects they choose, and that will be coming up, I think, at their next meeting. Uh, the conversion from HOV2 to HOV3 and CDOT's eyes seem to be going well. They're going to collect data and report back in a few months on how it's impacted uh, travel patterns. The stack is having lunch with the Transportation Commission tomorrow, so we can report back on how that goes. Um, and then there was a discussion of how to uh, prioritize projects in the National Freight 
highway freight program, which is, um, has about, what, $15 million per year in funding, and I think Doug's asked that the MPOs be briefed so that they can have more uh, input in the project selection list. I'll stop there. It was, it was a pretty uh, action-packed meeting. Thank you. Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Atchison. Believe it or not, we've talked about construction litigation. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> the other one was uh, transportation, and part of the same group is the Impact 64 group. Uh, there is still a lot of discussion about a referred measure uh, to the ballot this year. Although, if you watch what's going on in the legislature, this swap back and forth, and if you take this tax out and put this tax in, I think has just stalled any potential ballot measure this year for transportation unless we get the two parties to wake up and remember why they got elected. But uh, that, that is going to con continue to be an issue that we're still trying to work with. Impact 64 is actually meeting again this week to see if we can get any movement at all. But I think the big part of it, too, is when we, if we can get a bill referred, it's still going to come down to whether or not we can get to an agreement on how the monies will be divided and whether or not there will be an, an allowance for local control of spending the money that's coming to their municipalities and our counties. Uh, without that local control, I think most of the groups that are involved in this will definitely oppose any of the legislation that's brought forward because who knows better what you need to do in your community than you do. And I think that's a big part where we're still struggling with language in that area. So from that, uh, that's probably a good wrap-up. <clears throat> Metro Mayors, or excuse me, Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Jones. So I'll fill in, and then maybe in the future I can get Roger to do this report, <laughs> spread the love. Um, so Broomfield is chairing the Metro Area County Commissioners this year, and our first meeting was really around regional trail connectivity, and we heard from Boulder, Broomfield, and um, Adams County on their their trail systems and talked about how we might better connect them in the future. Thank you. Advisory Committee on Aging, Director Cernanek. Thank you. Uh, the uh, Advisory Committee on Aging actually meets on, on Friday, uh, so the vagaries of the month is we haven't had a meeting since our last board meeting. Um, but uh, I did want to uh, just apprise the board that we've changed the format of our meetings so that each time uh, one of the counties is giving kind of an update as to what they're doing and one of the special things that uh, are happening rather than trying to just go around the table and get little glimpses. It's uh, a lot more in depth as well as the staff reports are focused on the various different sections. Uh, this month we're dealing particularly with the ombudsman report. Uh, so Shannon uh, will be providing a, an in-depth element on, on that. And so uh, stay tuned. Good things will happen. Rack, Director Shock. Mr. Chairman, uh, Shakti asked if I would fill in since she was not able to attend the last meeting. Uh, basically, from the RAC standpoint, one of the first things we were looking at is at the time of the meeting, there were no legislative bills that are in the hopper for anything to do with air quality control. That was February 3rd. I can't tell you what's been dropped since then, if anything. A uh, big part of what we were doing was looking at the new outreach program on ozone and how that was coming along. A number of uh, comments by the board members and the public were made as to what the presentation looked like down to the point of what photos, what kind of photos should be used in the website and in the, and the information exchange going on so that more tied to what the ozone is, not just a pretty picture of the mountains because there's more to it than just that. So that's uh, still forthcoming and our next meeting is not until April. Thank you. E-470, Director Rakowski. Mike, please, thank you. Uh, the current bonds of the authorities of a certain group that's coming due will be refinanced at a lower interest rate, thereby saving money to be applied to even out the bond issues over the next 40 years. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Van Meter isn't here, but I will say one item for Fast Tracks update. Next Friday, the 24th, the Aurora Line, the R Line, opens along 225. Eight new stations, 10.5 miles, connecting the Peoria 
uh, um, heavy line that goes from downtown to the airport to the south metro station down going towards Lone Tree. So that 10.5 mile connection will be open next Friday the 24th and we're really looking forward to it. I believe they call that the Roth line. Yes, it is the R line for Roth, yes. So uh, one, one thing that I was very negligent in not mentioning earlier is with the, um, with the board officers change, what that means is that Jackie Malay, Director Malay, Mayor of Lone Tree, who has, is one of the only members of this current board who is five years plus tenure, she mentioned earlier she's been through two and a half tip cycles. I don't know if a half is any less painful than a whole, but but at any rate, um, this is her last meeting. Short of short of being uh, an alternate, Winshaw Councilmember Winshaw from Lone Tree has been attending meetings, and she will be the new director. But I want to thank Jackie for all of the work she did on this. Board. Any other matters by members? Director Stolzman. I just wondered if, when we would find out how many jelly beans there were in the jar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whose job was that to count those? Well, uh, no. So Aaron Brock at one. Oh, that that's right. Count. <laughs> I, I donated it to the Dr. Cog staff. He did. Oh. And, and I can tell you that the Dr. Cog staff ate every jelly bean. Yeah. Um, I think that there were around 1,500, and I think your guess was 1,600 and something. <laughs> rigged. <laughs> All right, seeing, uh, seeing nobody else, at 8.40 we are adjourned.